Um, if you have your Bibles, join me in the book of Isaiah. I'm going to read a short passage from Isaiah to start with and turn to chapter 42. This is a beautiful prophecy about someone that was to come. In Isaiah's day, he was talking about someone that was going to come, and this is what he's going to be like. And then I'm going to turn over and read from the book of Matthew 12, chapter 12, if you want to uh, find that location as well, and show you who it's referencing. But I wanted to read it from the Old Testament first. It's such a beautiful description. And how many of you know God... I've, I have said when I read his, his word, when I read God's scriptures, it's as if God is an artist and his paint is words. If you want to read a book that has pictures in it, read his Bible. He just is a master word craftsman and he paints a beautiful picture here of you and me, but he paints a beautiful picture of someone else too in this passage. I'm in Isaiah 42. I'm going to read verse, starting verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Ooh, I'm looking forward to that day. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. And this is such a beautiful picture at verse 3 of what he is like. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. And in verse 5, he says, this is what God, the Lord, says, the creator of the heavens. And if you turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 12, Isaiah prophesied about this servant that was going to come and set things straight. He's going to bring justice to the nations. He's going to bring justice in the earth. And he's not going to do it just with a loud shout and a He's not going to be that kind of a servant. He's going to come and be a certain type of servant that is so gentle with what he describes as, as bruised reeds and smoldering wicks, flickering wicks. And Matthew tells us who this servant is. I'm in Matthew 12. And just to set the scene here, Jesus has been in the synagogue where there's a man who is one of those bruised reeds and he's a smoldering wick. He has a, a shriveled hand. He's crippled. And Jesus raises the question in the synagogue, is it lawful to heal this man on the Sabbath? And nobody seems to want to jump up and answer that question. So Jesus gives them the answer. He says, which one of you that has a sheep that falls into a pit won't go out and save that sheep on the Sabbath. And he says very plainly, people are more valuable than sheep. And so he said, therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. I mean, imagine uh, these religious folks think they'd gotten to a point where they thought it was against the law of God, who is a loving God to do good to people who need somebody to desperately do good for them on the Sabbath. Well, in verse 14, it tells us the, the Pharisees, these religious leaders, they didn't like his answer. They went out and started plotting how they might kill Jesus. And so I'm going to pick up in verse 15, aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. A large crowd followed him. And he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. And Matthew quotes from the passage in Isaiah that I just read to you. Here is my servant 
whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. Look at verse 20, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. Matthew tells us who that servant is. And I'll tell you, his name is Jesus and he is the Christ, the Messiah. What a beautiful picture. I wanna to talk to you about a bruised reed and a smoldering wick. Father, I thank you for your word. And I pray that you will anoint me your servant to speak forth your message and anoint those who hear it to hear with their hearts, not just their ears, but with their hearts. And I pray that you will indeed heal and restore those who are bruised and broken and flickering this day in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 I don't know if, uh, if this is true of little girls. I, I grew up without a sister. I grew up with a brother. And we were, you've heard the expression, all boy. They say of little boys, they say, boy, he was all boy. I look back at some of the things my brother and I did growing up, and I'd have to say we were all boy. Usually what that means is you get into things you shouldn't even be getting into. And you do things that you shouldn't be doing, and your parents don't know, because, you know, back then you'd just go outside and roam the neighborhood. My brother and I, when we were quite young, we would... we. My parents gave us 22s and we, we'd take our guns out and, and, you know, as long as you're back by dinner time, it's okay. We'd roam the countryside. We'd be so far from home. And, uh, you know, I heard a comedian say, you know, back then, you know what happened to the, to the dumb kids? He said, they didn't make it. <laughs> and so, I don't know if that's true, but... Uh, it, we would say, we would say, you know, they're all boy. And as boys, we'd come home and we would have dings. You know what I mean by that? You get dinged up. You look down and I have had, I've had times when I looked down and I was bleeding and I didn't even know I was cut. And I didn't even know where I was bleeding from. Have you ever had that happen? I've had that happen even as an adult. Or at least you look down and, and you see some horrible bruise and you think, well, where did I get that? How did I get, how did I get that? Does that happen to anybody but me? Okay. Well, I, it may happen to little girls too. I don't know. I don't know if it does. I didn't raise girls. I raised boys. And I can tell you, boys get dinged up. And they get bruised. And I can tell you that I know something about bruises. I can tell you that bruises hurt. And the thing about a bruise is you don't often know that you have it. And you don't know where it came from or how you got it until you lean against something or someone touches you on that spot and it's like, ow, it hurts. Bruises are a type of internal injury that manifests on the surface in terms of you know, when you see it or you feel it or the pain of it. But it's a type of internal injury. In fact, it is a loss of blood. You know, our soldiers wear these bulletproof vests and thank, thank God we have such things as that now. But I don't know if you know it or not, but it still hurts because the energy of that bullet, even though the vest may stop it, the energy gets transferred and the vest may absorb some of it, but some of that shock wave goes right on into the body and it leaves a horrible bruise behind that vest. That's internal bleeding. Bruises hurt and bruises are a sign that you've been wounded and you may not notice it exactly. And I don't mean to sound pessimistic or, opti or, or too negative here when I say this, but you may not agree with me, but it seems to me like the longer you live, the longer a person lives in this world, the more bruised you become by it. 
I mean, I've been watching the news like you have and seeing all of the horrific things that are going on in this world. And I see all of the hate and all of the the bickering and the disagreeing and, and I see the wars that are prophesied about in Scripture that are unfolding in front of us. And, you know, I... My heart breaks like your heart breaks. I hope your heart breaks. I pray for people on both sides of the war. Don't get me wrong. I'm related to, I'm a descendant of Abraham. But isn't it interesting that both sides are descendants of Abraham? And all this is unfolding according to Scripture. I mean, I'm watching Scripture. I'm, I'm watching Scripture unfold in the news every day. And I don't claim to be an expert in prophecy, but I'm telling you, I'm listening for a trumpet. I think the rapture is about to happen. I'm telling you, the shadows are growing long. And no matter how good your life is or no matter how blessed you are, life has a way of bruising you. And I get it, when God speaks in his word, and I'm telling you, he is a master word craftsman. He paints with words. A beautiful picture of what life can be like in this world. He paints a picture of the face of every person who's ever been left bruised and windblown by storms in this life. But in this one verse, we also see that God paints one of the most beautiful pictures of himself. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but God is a God who handles people whose heart is bruised and whose faith is flickering. God is a God who handles them very gently. I'm so thankful that while we have a God who is all powerful, that even at his breath, the earth trembles. Amen. He utters his voice and mountains move. He is a God of gentleness when it comes to people like you and me who go through difficult seasons in this world. And so let me begin kind of by talking about bruised reeds and exactly, I wanna, I wanna help you see the picture that God's painting in this verse about what that reed exactly is. In the geographic region of the Bible narrative, you could find areas of marshy land around bodies of water, such as the Nile River or some of the lakes or some of the seas in that area. And growing in the marshy land near the water were these long stalks of grass-like vegetation. And these stalks would grow as a reed, as reeds, which are tall and slender and sort of hollow or pithy in the center of the stalk. Now, some of you have walked through some marshlands, or maybe you've walked through some field grass. And you kind of know what I'm talking about here. If you've ever walked through waist high field grass, these stalks would grow tall and they would stand straight. But if anything walked over them or if, if anyone stepped on them or if the winds blew hard enough and there was a storm that passed through, that harder outer layer would become crimped or broken. And that's what God is describing when he uses this expression, a bruised reed. And that reed, that stalk of, of vegetation would bend and would lay over and they would never stand up straight again. In fact, they were considered useless for anything really because of the bruising that made them weak. In fact, let me, let me focus a little more on bruises. And the interesting thing about this, as I study scripture, you know, there's 
I, every now and then I'll do a word study. You'll hear me say the Greek word here or the Hebrew word there means this. Interestingly, in this passages like this, we have the advantage of having both Hebrew and Greek because Matthew is specifically quoting from Isaiah. And that means that we, we have this unique opportunity to examine the words that are used both in the Greek language and in the Hebrew manuscripts to gain a more thorough understanding of the picture that God's painting about bruises. And both the word bruised and the word break are in the Hebrew and in the Greek. And so just to keep it simple, let me give you a general insight rather than something too deep here. But the Greek word that's translated as bruised in Matthew's version is derived from the combining of two words so that it speaks of the bent over reeds of a well-worn path. I don't know about your life, but sometimes I, I, I can relate to that. I can think, you know, my life seems pretty well worn. <laughs> and in both the Hebrew and the Greek, the words that are translated as bruised speak of something that's, that's literally crushed or, or broken over. It's something that's been snapped over as if as something or someone has walked over it. it and God calls it a bruised reed. And the second word that says, when it says God won't, that, that this servant that's coming is not going to break that. In both the Hebrew and the Greek, it indicates something that's completely broken into pieces. It's something that, that you would take a hold of and pull apart into two separate pieces. But the beautiful thing about this passage, and I can't tell you how many times in my life when things get so distressing that I have turned to this very scripture as a standalone scripture, I have often found such comfort in this passage. Because as God paints this picture, he is not simply painting a picture of tall grass in the marshlands. He is painting a picture of the lives of people like you and me. In the end of this previous chapter in Matthew's account of this, Jesus has just given an invitation to all who are weary and burdened. And that invitation is immediately followed by a story of some hungry disciples who end up getting criticized by the religious leaders for picking some grain to eat as they walk through the grain field on the Sabbath day. My goodness, if you're going to criticize somebody and, and, and condemn them to hell because they ate a meal on Sunday, heaven help us. Because I think there's been more fried chicken eaten on Sunday than any other day until Chick-fil-A came along. But these religious leaders criticized them for picking grain and eating it because they're hungry. And then that in turn is followed by this pitiful story of this crippled man I mentioned in the synagogue that the Pharisees think should not be healed on the Sabbath. And these religious leaders who should be feeding the hungry and the religious leaders who, who have never healed this man any other day of the week, religious leaders who are more interested in bruising him than they are in healing him. And Jesus ends up having to withdraw because those same Pharisees wanted to kill, kill him for healing the crippled man. And the Bible says that there were these multitudes of people who were sick and in need who followed him. Now that's the, that's the canvas. And Matthew, under the unction of the Spirit of God, dips his brush into the paint of the words of Isaiah about the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, this servant, 
And, and Isaiah had prophesied that one day there would be bruised reeds, people whose lives have been so wounded and the world had bruised them and, and people with nowhere else to turn would one day find a servant of God, the Messiah, who knows what to do with bruised lives. And so these people that are following Jesus are trampled underfoot and the world is too cruel and uncaring to even lift them back up. And Isaiah foretold of the coming of this Messiah who invites everyone who has been bruised by this world to come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. Come to me when you're crippled. Come to me when the world has, has abused you and bent you over. And Isaiah says he knows what to do with bruised reeds. And he promises that if you come to him, he won't break you. Well, because Isaiah, the same prophet that prophesied of this Messiah coming, he's the same prophet that prophesied that when the Messiah comes, he's going to be a man who is acquainted with sorrow. He's acquainted with grief. This servant is going to be, this Messiah is going to be despised and rejected and stricken and smitten and afflicted. And he would be wounded for our transgressions. And listen to this word. He will be bruised for our iniquities. And, and that the punishment that, that, that was upon him is going to bring us peace. And by his wounds, we would be healed. I'm telling you, Christ Jesus knows who are bruised by this world and he knows he understands bruising and he knows how to deal with people who are bruised and so maybe you've experienced the criticism of the religious folks but he understands that too let me talk about secondly the smoldering wicks what a picture God paints with his words of a person whose faith and hope is all but gone. You've tried to be strong and you've tried to weather the storm. You've tried to endure the difficulties that have come your way in life and you've tried to keep your faith. But the winds have blown so hard. And if you can just envision this picture of a lamp or a candle that's lit and the wind is blowing until the flame is just barely flickering, just about to be extinguished. It is a picture of these people who've been following Jesus, who are sick and desperate. It's the leper who has no hope left. It's a woman pressing her way through the crowd who has tried everything else reaching for the hem of his garment. It's a blind man on the side of the road crying, David, son of David, have mercy on me. It's a, a Canaanite woman whose child is demon possessed or the centurion whose servant has no hope. Or maybe it's the neighbor across the street from you who doesn't know where their son is. Or it might be a coworker that just got the bad news from their doctor. Or maybe it's a friend who understands the pain of, of betrayal and abandonment by their spouse. This world is full of people that God describes as smoldering wicks because the wind is blowing until your faith and your hope is just all but extinguished. And the world would just snuff you out. But not Jesus. In fact, Jesus is the one who called us to be a light on the hill. He said, nobody lights a candle to put it under a bushel. We used to sing a song when I was growing up. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. We're, we're going to put, we're going to put Mike in charge of this song with the children next Sunday. For our TV viewers, he was waving his arms as we were singing, I'll fly away this morning. <laughs> Won't let Satan it out. Remember that? 
I'm going to let it shine. Jesus said, I put a light in you and I expect you to shine like a light on a hill. Why? Because this world is full of darkness. And yeah, the, the devil, the enemy will try to discourage you and take your hope and he'll send the winds into your life to blow. But God is revealed in scripture as the Lord your God who is a consuming fire. John the Baptist prophesied one day he said, I baptize you in water, but there's someone coming after me. Now, this is the servant that Isaiah spoke about. There's someone coming after me whose sandals I'm not even worthy to stoop down and unlace. And I baptize you in water, but that servant, that Messiah is going to baptize you not only in the Holy Spirit, but with fire. What does that mean? Let me tell you something. When, when they built this tabernacle in the days of Moses, did you know when they brought that first offering, the Bible says that the fire came down from heaven, the fire of God. It was God who lit that fire. And God gave them instructions, don't ever let this fire go out. And day after day after day, they would have to go and pour oil into the, into the vessel so that it would continue, perpetually burn in the tabernacle. Even in the days of the temple of Solomon, we see that there, there were, there were uh, the same thing happened. They brought the, the sacrifice and the Bible says that the fire of God came and lit that fire and consumed that sacrifice. You say, well, what does that have to do with our Messiah? Well, there happened to be a prophet named Zechariah who had a vision one day that changed everything. An angel woke him up and said, what do you see? And he said, well, I see a solid gold lampstand, kind of like the one they used to have in the tabernacle, kind of like the one at the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Solomon. And it has this bowl at the top and it has seven lamps or lights on it with seven channels to the lights. But he said, the difference here is I see two olive trees next to it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. And the angel said, what are these? He asked the angel, what are these? And the angel said, do you not know what these are? He said, no, my Lord, I don't know what these are. He said, these two olive trees were supplying a continual flow of oil to the lamps, a perpetual fire. Not simply by the hands of a priest who had to refill the vessel every day. And Zechariah couldn't understand it. And so this is what the angel said to him. He said, you go tell Zerubbabel, who was the man that was rebuilding the temple, that this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. He said, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Well, Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm telling you that that angel delivered a message not just to Zerubbabel, but to the temple of God, which is the body of Christ under the new covenant, saying there's a day coming when the fire won't depend on the hands of a human priest to enter into a holy place to fill it with oil. Because the day is coming when it will be not by might of man, nor by the power of human hands, but it will be by my spirit, the oil will come to keep the fire burning continually on the altar. Maybe the winds have blown in your life and you feel like your hope is just almost gone. Maybe you feel like your flame is just flickering in the wind. Well, God wants you to know that if you'll come to me, this is the words of Jesus, all you who are weary and burdened, I'll give you rest. I'm telling you that a smoldering wick, bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not extinguish. And so they came. A desperate father a bleeding woman pressing through the crowd, a Samaritan woman at the well, an adulterer caught in the act, a blind beggar, a fisherman, a tax collector, the sick, a man with a crippled hand, 
a man who was crippled and carried on beds and lowered through a ceiling. They all came, the hungry, the thirsty, the destitute, the disturbed. They came, all of them. And every one of them were just bruised reeds and smoldering wicks, lives that were touched by the evil that prevails in this fallen world, but they came. And they came with, they came with the promise that this Messiah knows how to handle bruised reeds. He'll not break you, and he'll never snuff out a smoldering wick. And do you know why? Why this Christ deals so tenderly with those who are bruised? And why he is so careful to protect the wick that's flickering and whose faith is about to be extinguished? The answer might just surprise you, but it's true. He said in Matthew 11, right in the middle of this invitation to come to him, he said, I am gentle and humble in heart. That blows my mind. That the almighty, all-powerful God, the creator of the universe, will put on flesh and dwell among us and describe himself in those words. The same creator that flung the stars into the heavens and calls them all by name, described himself to the bruised reeds and the smoldering wicks as one who is gentle and humble in heart. Is that not incredible? So when we're weary and we're bruised and we're just smoldering, the invitation still stands. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. And we look at the news and we see what's going on in this world. I'm telling you, it can be disheartening. But I want to remind you that God still sits on the throne and He's ultimately in control. And history is still his story. And everything that is happening on the world stage right now is playing out just according to his word. Everything that he has said is coming. I'm telling you, the shadows of the end, the prophecies of the end times are casting their shadows upon us. Well, what do you do in these times? You come to Jesus. When my hope is just almost gone, and when my faith is just flickering and I feel bruised, my soul feels bruised, we come to Jesus because he knows what to do with us. He'll give us rest. Amen. I'm waiting for that trumpet. Whew, any moment. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your power. I thank you for all these blessings, but God, today I thank you for your, your gentleness and your humbleness in how you deal with bruised people whose faith and hope are just flickering. I thank you for your gentleness and your humility, your humbleness in dealing with me and those who've heard this message. I lift up the wounded, the bruised to you. God, this world is full of people who have been so wounded by the events that are going on in the world. I lift them up to you. I pray, God, that they will find this servant that Isaiah told us about, the servant that came in the days of Matthew, the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus, who is Lord. And I pray that you will draw us to you, Lord and heal our bruised hearts. I pray a blessing over your people. I pray a blessing over Israel. God, be with them and guide them, I pray in Jesus' name.